The Bible is the word of Almighty God. Therefore, it does not need to be defended, only understood. The purpose of this program is to present to you, our viewers, the key to understanding the scriptures. There is within the pages of the Bible itself a God-given design for studying the Bible. All the confusion that exists within Christianity today is the result of two failures. Number one, ignoring God's design for Bible study, and number two, failing to believe what the Bible actually says. We remind you of what the Lord Jesus Christ said in Matthew 5.18, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall abide forever. We're instructed in Romans 3.4, Let God be true, but every man a liar. We are informed by 2 Timothy 3.16 that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And as well, God tells us how to study his word in 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rather dividing the word of truth. That's God's design, rather dividing the word of truth. Not according to your liking, not into verses you want or don't want to obey, but making distinctions where God makes distinctions. Obeying that portion of the Bible that is specifically addressed to us today. Now, here is our teacher, Pastor Thomas Bruchet. Well, on behalf of all of us at Grace Bible Church, I want to thank you for tuning in again. Not just all those in, at Grace Bible Church, but all those who are involved in this ministry of of the message of grace. Those who are on the production crew, we get together and we make these shows so that we might present to you the truth of God's Word. There is no ego trip involved in here. We're not trying to display our faces all over where we can be seen and, and gloat about that. But there is a message from God's Word and from the sincerity of our heart. We want to share God's Word with you today and, and every week. And we hope that you'll tune in and watch this program Many times on our program, The Message of Grace, we teach you the Bible, and we get in great detail and, and sometimes good depth in teaching you the Scriptures. Today I want to lighten up a little bit, and I want to share with you a passage of Scripture from the book of John, chapter 6, and show you something that happened in the life and the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ, that although He was here teaching and only came to the nation of Israel, by way of application we can understand the truth of what he was teaching them, and then realized through the Apostle Paul, who he later sent to the Gentiles, that we were included and invited to come to him in this age of grace in which we live today. Here he's inviting the nation of Israel, but we'll look at it in the sense, in a general sense, and realize that even today we've been invited. And in John chapter 6, in verse 1, it says, After these things Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is, in the, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went into the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw the great company come unto him, he said, and I'm just going to stop right there, there's a great multitude of people that are following him. According to verse 2, they're following him because of the miracles that they've seen him do and healing those that were diseased. And as they followed him, it even tells us the time of the season. It says the, the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was nigh. Now that's an interesting uh, Passover feast. That's an interesting festival in Jewish history. It's biblical history. It goes back to the book of Exodus. And it's God who delivered the nation of Israel from bondage in Egypt out to the wilderness where he then would lead them to the promised land, a land that flowed with milk and honey. There's a, a great picture of salvation in the freeing, freeing of Israel who was in bondage to the Egyptians. There's a picture of freedom there, there's a picture of salvation in, with, in the fact that they were in bondage. Just as we are all in bondage to sin, they were in bondage to the Egyptians. And by a great power of God, the God reached out and did something miraculous to provide for them freedom from slavery. So it is that God has reached down in our behalf and provided us freedom from slavery. But in the Passover, the reason it's even called Passover, there's a couple things involved. The night of the Passover, the Jews had a feast. And there was a special dinner they were to eat. They were supposed to eat a lamb. They were supposed to take a lamb and they were to sacrifice a lamb and roast the lamb on an altar and then eat that lamb that night in haste. And on the table was also some unleavened bread. 
And, in, and then that night, when they ate it, they ate it in haste because they're going to be delivered the next day. That night was called the Passover plague, as God put ten plagues upon the Egyptians in order to get Pharaoh to let Israel go. The last and tenth plague was the Passover plague, in which God was going to destroy and kill all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. Anyone who had not applied the Passover lamb's blood, and what they would, the, the Israel did, the nation of Israel took, and the lamb that they sacrificed, and the lamb that they ate that night, they took the blood of that lamb and they put it on the doorpost, on the two side posts, and on the upper lentil post. And there they, they put that blood and applied it. And when God judged Egypt that night, as he came to that home, when he saw the blood applied, he passed over that house. And no one in that house died. They were saved and delivered from bondage in Egypt. But the Egyptians, all their firstborn died. There was destruction in every home where the blood wasn't applied. Now, in light of that event, which is, the verse says, it's nigh, that Jesus Christ takes and he begins to teach something to them. He first does it by way of illustration. Here there's a great multitude, and it's interesting as you follow the chapter through, that starts out with a great multitude and it, it'll end up getting narrowed down. But there's a multitude that followed him, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw the great company come unto him, and he said unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And he said, he said this to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred pennies worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are these among so many? Well, that's a good question, but he brings it to the Lord, and that's where you bring your questions. And although it's too small, it's enough when it's given to the hands of the Lord. And, you know, you can sense uh, Andrew's statement here. He's only got five barley loaves and not just two fishes, but two small fishes. But what is that among so many? The next verse is going to tell us, next couple verses will tell us there's over 5,000 men that are there before them. That great company numbers 500 in men, and that's not counting the women that might be among the men and the children that might have journeyed with them. But when they delivered this to the hands of our Lord, it says in verse 10, Jesus said, Make the men to sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to his disciples and his disciples to them that sat down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. You know, it's interesting, before they ate this big, <laughs> they, they took and divided the loaves and, and shared it, and had this meal together, the Lord gave thanks. I wonder if you give thanks before you eat in your home, before you have dinner. One of the, the most basic truths, the most basic ways of being uh, praised and giving honor to God is us being a thankful people. And you know, it's one thing to sit down and eat and gobble something up and never stop and think about where it came from and who caused it to grow and why is it that you have it. And uh, every time you see the Lord eat, whether it's the breaking of the bread of communion or right here before he serves the loaves and the fishes, they stopped and gave thanks. But he took these loaves, and it's interesting, he breaks it, gives to his disciples, and the disciples take, and they, they give to the people. Verse 12 says, And when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men that had seen the miracle that Jesus did said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. You get the idea from here that they're beginning to realize who Jesus Christ is, that they have some idea of, of his miraculous ability. But you know, as you read through the chapter, you find out that the things that they're recognizing are not things of, of the nature of Jesus Christ, and the deity of Jesus Christ, and he is the Savior who came into the world to be the king of the nation of Israel. Oh, they, they want to make him a king. The next verse says, When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force and make him a king, he departed uh, into a, a mountain himself alone. And the reason he departed is they were not coming to make him king out of reverence, out of worship, out of recognition of who he is. They were coming to make him king by force because 
of the Social Security benefit that he could provide for them. My, if you had a, a king, instead of taking taxes from the people, here you could have a king who would turn around and take five barley loaves and be able to feed the whole nation with it. And so they're looking at this out of a, out of a self-sacrificing, excuse me, a, a self-receiving uh, thing. They just something what they could get out of him without a, a, absolutely sitting down and acknowledging the fact that what, we're following this man. He's done some notable miracles. He must indeed be the Son of God. He must be God who came into the world, the long-promised Messiah, that we should fall at his feet and worship him and, and put a crown upon his head. That wasn't their attitude at all. Jesus goes off into the mountain alone, and the next time we, we find the, the multitude getting together with the Lord, it's the same multitude, but there's an event that takes place in between, and that is the disciples, they go across the sea on boat. Jesus stayed behind for a little bit, and then he walked upon the water and met the disciples and finished off going to the other side with them. The next day, the multitude looks all over. Where is the Lord? They knew there was only one boat, and the disciples took that. They go out seeking him, they come to the other side, and there they find him, and they're all intrigued. But he says in verse 26, Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. The only reason you're following me is because you just want out of me what will satisfy you. You do not want to approach me for any reason of, of who I am and what I'm trying to communicate to you by the things that I'm doing. And the next verse says, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath the Father sealed. You know, that verse begins to tell us something, that Jesus Christ, when he walked around and he performed miracles, was not just trying to show people his great ability. He could have done that with ease. But every miracle that he did had a meaning behind it. And he tells these people, look, labor not for the meat that perisheth. Don't just follow me for the physical bread that I can give you. There's something more to it than, than what you're seeing just in the physical. Listen to what I have to say, and I'm going to teach you a lesson now based on what you saw in me feeding you with these loaves, and learn the spiritual lesson. Labor not for the meat that perisheth, the physical thing, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give you. Food that the Son of Man shall give you, for him hath the Father sealed. When it says, him hath the Father sealed, what Jesus Christ is saying is that Jesus Christ himself is the sum and the seal of all that God the Father was trying to communicate to mankind. The Old Testament all is about Jesus Christ, revealing Jesus Christ before he came. Jesus Christ walked the earth, and what he did in those miracles is authenticate who he was the one sent from God, God manifested in the flesh, dwelling amongst men, come to be the savior of mankind and someday to return and be king of the, to the nation of Israel and over all the earth. And then the, the, when Jesus Christ leaves, the balance of the New Testament goes back and is records for us who Jesus Christ was so that we who lived after he came and, and went away might believe on him. He's the seal of all that the Bible has to say. He's the sum and total of all that God the Father would have you to know. And you know, it's a dangerous thing to play around with other so-called gods and, and deities and, and, uh, and, and prophets and follow other teaching and religions when God the Father would say, Jesus Christ is it. And he points to Jesus Christ. And he says here that he is the Son of Man that will give unto them the bread that, ha that will give them everlasting life. They, they begin to reject the message that he's about to say because they're so caught up in the physical that they couldn't see that there was a spiritual truth to be learned by this example of the feeding of the 5,000. You see two examples in it. First, you see that Jesus Christ, who's not just the bread of life, he is also the Word of God. He is the message. He's the seal. He's everything that God wants us to know. He wants us to know about Jesus Christ. And as Jesus Christ took the bread and divided it to his apostles, or his, his disciples, and his disciples carried it and fed the multitude with it, there's a picture there that Jesus Christ is the message of God, the message of life, in which he shared to his disciples, and then his disciples were to carry the message of eternal life to the world. And that message centers in the seal, Jesus Christ. And so he, he's a picture of that as he, as he feeds them here. The, also, the, the other picture is that what that message is about. We know from the communion service. 
that Jesus Christ says that the communion that we take, the bread that's broken, is a representation of his body, which on the cross was bruised and broken for the payment of man's sins. And the juice that we drink, the fruit of the vine, is a symbolic picture of the blood that was shed at Calvary because without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins. The Jews knew that. When they did Passover, they sacrificed a lamb and drained the lamb. The sacrifice was their, for their forgiveness of sins. And they would, they would kill that lamb and shed that blood for a sacrifice unto God in order to be forgiven. And Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of all of that. And so when he talks about this bread, the message is about him. And while they might not understand it at this time, what he's revealing there is that he is the one whose body is going to be broken and his blood is going to be shed for the payment of sin. And so he's, he is that message that they are to carry out. And when you look at the feeding of the 5,000, the message is wonderful. He took the bread and he broke it, five barley loaves of bread, distributes it to the, to the, the 5,000 plus people that are out there, and when they were all done and everybody was filled, it was sufficient to fill everybody and it was all done, they took up five, excuse me, 12 baskets full of fragments of bread that was left over. In other words, Jesus Christ, who this same chapter, such as in verse 48, he says plainly, I am the bread of life. Jesus Christ, who is an example of that bread of life and what he's about to do on Calvary's cross to die for the payment of man's sin, is going to be a sufficient payment to cover the sins of all of Israel, and as we know through the Apostle Paul, the sins of the whole world, and that there's plenty left over. There is not a person that will ever die and will not have for them a sufficient payment for their sin. Jesus Christ was it. But if they reject Jesus Christ, turn down the bread of life, they will suffer the consequence when, when all their salvation was totally paid for by him. When well, these people began to reject, it says in verse 28, they said unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he hath sent. They said, Give us the works, we'll do the works. And Jesus Christ says, This is the work of God. They said, Works, plural, he said there's one work, and that's the work of God, and the thing for them to do is to believe on him whom he has sent. And then he goes on to explain that he is the bread, the true bread, that's sent down from heaven. It says in verse 33, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven, and giveth life unto the world. They said unto him, Lord, moreover, give us this bread. Boy, bread that can give you eternal life, give it to us. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. Very clear teaching of what Jesus Christ is saying. He said, I'm the one who's able to impart eternal life for you. All he's asking them to, believe, to do is to believe who he is. He's the one sent down from heaven. What he wants them to do is to come to him in faith for once and believe on who he is, and he'll give them everlasting life. There is, in this teaching, an absolute teaching of the cross, a picture of the cross, the body that's broken, the blood that's shed, but even here, he's not asking them to even catch the full ramification of all that he's saying, just come to me and believe who I am. You and I who live in the age after the cross, God, what he would tell us is not just to believe who Jesus Christ is, but to believe what Christ has done for us. It says in Romans chapter uh, uh, 4 and verse 23, 24, and 25, it says that God's promise to us is that Jesus Christ was delivered for our offenses and was raised for our justification. They said, Jesus Christ told them here that he is the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. I think there's a thirsting in everyone's soul, a hunger in everyone's soul to know truth to know reality, to know what the answer of life is. I recently met a woman who was troubled paying a psychiatrist because she just breaks into fits of, of crying. She has a nice home, she's got a nice family, she's got everything going for her, no loss of a loved one in recent times, and yet she just breaks out crying. So she pays a psychiatrist and she takes the tranquilizer he gives her and she goes home and continues to cry. There's no solution there. As I talked to her, I said, why don't you, tr why don't you give the Lord Jesus Christ a chance? Why don't you come to him with your hunger? Why don't you come to him with your thirst? He promises to satisfy, and he has satisfied the full payment of our sins. 
and that's the lear your learning, yearning of your heart. In this passage, Jesus Christ goes on to say in verse 40, This is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Again, in verse 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Verse 29, verse 35, verse 40, verse 47, four times Jesus Christ says, when he talked about himself as being the bread of life, he says, come to me, believe on me, and you're saved. You have everlasting life because I'm the Savior. After all those times, the people keep rejecting who he was, asking, oh, is not he the, the son of Joseph, rather than acknowledging he's the son of God. And they begin to take and say, oh, he must be talking about cannibalism that we got to eat his flesh and drink his blood. And they brought this up first, and Jesus Christ then takes their words and just gives it back to them, because when they rejected the obvious sight, the miracle that he, they saw, when they rejected the very clear teaching of what he's saying, come and believe on me and be saved, then he begins to use their language. They wanted an excuse not to believe, and so he began to talk in what verse 60 calls hard speech. And it was so hard that they began not to understand. He starts talking about eating flesh and drinking blood. And that was something forbidden for the Jews, something that's still wrong. And yet it was something he said, but he said it because that's what they were twisting his words to mean. So he just gave them their hard language back. I would tell you, don't play games with God. If God says that Jesus Christ is sufficient... If God said Jesus Christ died on the cross for all your sins, if God said Jesus Christ, his body was broken and his blood was shed in full, complete payment of your sin, and that's enough. It's enough to save all who come unto him. Then you shouldn't play God, games with God and, and say when someone tells you about being saved through faith in Jesus Christ and say, well, you know, that's your interpretation. And you know, the Bible, it's hard to understand and people interpret it different ways. Listen to verse 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. How do you interpret that? Well, I can only interpret it to say exactly what it says. You might have trouble with the word verily. It means truly. Okay, we're over that hump. Truly, truly, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. What God always intended man to do is to come and to believe on him. Jesus Christ said to believe on him, you'd have everlasting life. He says later on in verse 63, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth you nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. He told them before he started talking, he says, Now don't go after the meat. Don't talk about the physical meat that perisheth. Let's talk about the meat that endures unto everlasting life. And he begins to talk about himself as the bread of life. And then they begin to take him physically as he's teaching a spiritual lesson and talking about, oh, he's teaching cannibalism. Some people go to those hard verses and they, try, they actually begin to teach that in order for you to be saved, you've got to actually eat the bread and it's got to become the, blood, the body of Christ and you've got to drink the juice and it's got to become the blood of Jesus Christ in order to save you. And Jesus Christ said from the beginning, don't talk about the meat that perishes, not the physical. Believe on me and be saved. He now says that the words that he speaks unto them, they are spirit and they are life. He says, the flesh, the physical, will profit you nothing. What he wants you to do is to believe his words. And always that's been God's desire. That's why the Old Testament revealed Jesus Christ before he came. That's why the miracles authenticated Jesus Christ when he was here. And that's why the record of the New Testament tells us about what Jesus Christ taught in, in his earthly ministry and from his ascended position in heaven that we might center everything in Jesus Christ and believe the words of Jesus Christ. Because by believing the words of Jesus Christ, you can be saved. The message that he had to, to share with us. But he says in verse 64, But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who would, who would believe not, who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. The Lord Jesus Christ knew everyone's heart because he's God. He knows your heart. He knows whether you're playing games and calling yourself a Christian or whether you indeed believe that Jesus Christ came down from heaven, was virgin born, lived an absolutely sinless life, went to the cross and died on the cross for your sins and was raised for your justification. You know, God knows your heart. I don't know. I try very hard not to judge people's salvation. But I would judge your words because Christ says it's the words that you're supposed to believe. 
And if I would ask you if you're saved today and you would answer me, well, yeah, I go to church. Well, I try to do good. I try to live a good life. I don't think I sin too much. Well, and I confess my sin, I pray when I do. And you begin to tell me all the works that you do, and this verse tells me the flesh profit for you nothing, that the words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life, that the words that Jesus Christ spoke give you everlasting life. And he talked about his body being the death, his death on the cross as being the payment of sin. And if you're trusting what you're doing rather than what he did, the work of God for your salvation, then if you say those things, then I say that your heart is not trusting in Jesus Christ. You're trusting yourself. It says, from that time on, many of the disciples went back and walked no more with him. It says, then Jesus said unto the twelve, will you go away? We started with a great multitude following. Hey, yeah, we're all following the Lord. And then as he began to speak about truth and about believing that he came down from heaven, that began to separate people. When he began to talk about believing on him, and, and they can't do the works for salvation, but they must believe in him to do the work of salvation, they begin to separate the people. And finally, there's a great multitude, even his disciples are beginning to leave him. He turns to the twelve apostles, will you leave? And Peter answered, asked the great question. He said, then Simon Peter answered unto him, Lord, to whom, we go, who, whom, to whom will we go? For thou hast the words of eternal life. Peter understood that it's the words that I'm to believe. And, and Jesus Christ has the words of eternal life. Believe on him and be saved. Peter says, we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. As I told you before, the thing that God would have us to believe is not just that Jesus is the Christ, but that Jesus is the Christ who died for your sins and rose again, that he might give you as a gift eternal life upon faith. Will you believe? We hope this program has been an eye-opener to you. We are not out to destroy anyone's faith, but to establish your faith upon the truth. Only then will you experience real liberty. The truth shall set you free. If we could be of any further assistance to you, we would love to help you. Or if you would like any of the free literature you see on your screen, you may call or write Grace Bible Church, 13630 Common Road, Warren, Michigan, 48093. Our phone number is area code 313-778-5032. Once again, that's Grace Bible Church, 13630 Common Road, Warren, Michigan, 48093. Area code 313-778-5032. This program was presented freely to you in cooperation with this local public cable station. Thank you for sharing this time with us. Join us again this time next week to learn more about God's message of grace. Until then, this is Daniel Schulert speaking for all of us at Grace Bible Church, praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being lightened, that ye may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe.